In the back. My name is Jim Gilmore. I'm the Administrative Commissioner for New York, and I will be chairing the Horseshoe Crab Board meeting today. Uh, we have a few things to go through in the agenda, and uh, but first, before we get into that, just wanted to, and I know they're not here, but a shout out to the main delegation for that and the ASMFC staff for one of the most, the best dinners I think I've ever had, and uh, I slept like a baby last night, so I just hope they're going to repeat it again tonight, because I think it was really very popular. Um, also, I'd like to introduce Mike Schmidtke. He's a new ASMEC staff that's going to be working on, AS, uh, on uh, horseshoe crabs and uh, joining the team today. So welcome, Mike. Uh, first order of business is approval of the agenda. Everyone has it in their briefing documents. Uh, are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, we'll adopt those as in the, in the briefing book. Second order of business is the uh, August 2016 proceedings. Are there any changes to those proceedings? Seeing none, we will adopt those. Before each meeting, we have public comment uh, on issues not on the agenda. I did not have anybody sign up for uh, making a comment, but is there anybody in the audience right now that would make uh, public comment on issues not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll move right into our first order of business, which is the, um, the ARM subcommittee report, and Kristen's going to give us a presentation on that. Kristen? All right, thank you. Good morning. Uh, this morning I'm going to update you on the activity of the ARM subcommittee and the harvest recommendations for 2017 in the Bay. So first, I'll just remind you of the objective statement for the ARM model, which is to maximize the harvest of horseshoe crab while maintaining a population that can sustain the migrating birds, specifically the red knots. So this morning, I would like to talk briefly about the red knot and horseshoe crab population thresholds in the ARM model, uh, their abundance estimates for this year, the five harvest packages as they currently exist, and the recommendation for fishing for 2017. So there are a couple thresholds in the ARM model that I think are important to review. Uh, one is female horseshoe crabs, and that was set at 80% carrying capacity, and that turns out to be 11.2 million female crabs. For red knots, it's 81,900 birds. And additionally, you have to maintain a operational sex ratio of two males to one female. So that's on the spawning beaches, that's not out in the ocean. And these two thresholds are important because this is how we understand when and how we get female harvest in the bay, because that continues to sort of be an issue. Um, so I wanted to review these so that you understand when uh, female harvest could be possible. Uh, so this is an either or situation. If the birds hit their threshold, then there's the possibility for female harvest, because regardless of how many female horseshoe crabs are there, they're sustaining the bird population. And conversely, if the crabs hit their threshold, even if the birds do not, there's the possibility for female harvest, because there are enough horseshoe crabs to sustain the population where we want it to be. Um, additionally, if that sex ratio falls below two to one, there would be no male harvest, uh, but that hasn't happened, and uh, it doesn't get close to that. But just a reminder that that's also a threshold that exists in the model. So this is the red knot abundance for the last few years. Uh, the blue line is the Mark Resite estimations of the abundance of the red knots in the Delaware Bay, and the red line is the threshold. So you can see how close or far we have been from it. Uh, and those are the 95% confidence intervals around their estimations. So fewer birds stopped in the bay in 2016 than the previous year, uh, but the estimates were very similar to 2014. Um, the estimates were 47,300 birds, and that is below the bird threshold. For the horseshoe crabs, um, we use the Virginia Tech trawl survey to make estimates of the population for horseshoe crabs. And as you know, that doesn't 
run every year. So in lieu of the Virginia Tech trial survey estimates, we have a composite index that's uh, been developed from a few surveys in the Bay. And so the black lines up there are the Virginia Tech trial survey estimates, and the top graph is for males and the bottom for females. And you can see in the years that we have the trial that they match pretty closely. So when we don't have the trial survey, which we did not have last year, uh, we use the composite index. Uh, the survey is underway this year, so next year we'll be able to use those results for the horseshoe crab abundance, uh, as well as continue to tune the composite index with another year of data. Um, the 2015 estimate for female horseshoe crabs was 8.1 million, uh, so that is also under the 11.2 threshold. But it, there was a slight uptick of crabs this year, so that's, that's a good sign. These are the five harvest packages as they currently stand, uh, from full moratorium to both male and female harvest. For the last several years, the package has recommended, uh, the R model has recommended package three, which is the 500,000 male only harvest. Uh, and the way the R model works is we put these abundance into season and it goes through all possible states of the population, uh, the juvenile abundances, birds, males, females, and recommends a harvest package based on what would um, be best for both of those populations. So this is just a summary of the numbers we already went over, the male and the female horseshoe crab numbers for this year, as well as the bird estimates. Both are below threshold, uh, and the harvest package recommendation is the same as it's been for the last several years, which is harvest package three, the 500,000 male only harvest. Um, so I just want to talk briefly about some of the upcoming challenges the ARM subcommittee has been discussing. Uh, as you know, we went un under this uh, short-term review and we made several recommendations about how the R model could be um, fine-tuned, and one of those was the incorporation of the biomedical data, which does prove to be the largest challenge moving forward. Um, and so I'll just remind you that biomedical currently is not accounted for in the arm. Uh, the reason we feel like it should be is because it accounts for 8 to 12 percent of the coastwide mortality. And we have put forward a preferred option and a minority opinion uh, that we've already presented to you, but I will just briefly remind you so that when Kirby talks about the addendum, you'll remember what we were talking about. So the preferred option was to adjust the harvest packages to account for what the biomedical is already harvesting. These are made up numbers. So on the left are the harvest packages as we've already talked about. And on the right is uh, just an example of what that could look like. So what we would do is take a three to five year average of what the biomedical <laughs> harvests in the bay and remove that from the current harvest packages. This is not a quota for biomedical. We're not putting a cap on them or limiting them. We're just purely accounting for, on average, what they, the mortality we're attributing to them. So that number might be revised every six years or so. We don't want to violate any uh, data confidentiality, so we'll be using averages, uh, adjusting it not every year but um, continuing to tune that number to reflect what's occurring in the Bay. So that was the preferred option as put forth by the ARM subcommittee. The minority opinion or option was to incorporate it into the population dynamics model, um, using that 15% mortality, putting it in the kind of workings of the model rather than applying it to the harvest packages. So the harvest packages would remain unchanged. Um, and Exploring this option is time consuming uh, because the model goes through multiple iterations under different states of the population. And so it's a, it's a cumbersome process and I will just show you briefly why that is. So this is uh, as simple as I could make the population dynamics model. Uh, and you can see you have the juvenile horseshoe crabs and they can remain juvenile horseshoe crabs to the next year or they can go on to the pre-breeding stage, or they can skip pre-breeding and go straight to being an adult male or an adult female, or they can die. So those are multiple steps just for the juveniles. For the pre-breeders, they can also remain a pre-breeder the next year, or they can mature and become a breeding male or female. Uh, additionally, they can die. 
and then the adult males and females have a survivorship where they can remain in that stage. They're also feeding back to the juveniles as well as being harvested. So when the R model is kind of balancing all these different states, uh, the most simplistic way to think about it is that the horseshoe crabs available next year are the number of juveniles that go straight to adults, plus the pre-breeders that go straight to adults, plus the adults that survive, minus the harvest. So I'm, what we would be suggesting in this minority opinion is sort of adding on to that red step, the amount that die or get harvested. Um, and so we would be accounting for it in this stage. You know, it would reduce the survivorship of those males or females in the adult stage and kind of be part of the harvest there rather than at the, um, rather than adjusting the actual harvest packages. Uh, and so while that sounds simple in theory, uh, it's just a, it's a time consuming step to kind of explore the sensitivity of the results to incorporating the biomedical. Um, so that's the population dynamics model. So with that, I can take any questions about the ARM activities. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Great presentation. Questions for Kristen? Rob O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Christy. And I, I have two questions, um, and they're old questions. Uh, the 15% mortality for the biomedical process, um, I think last meeting we Hey, Rob, could you pull the microphone a little closer? We're having trouble hearing you. How's that? Uh, so the 15% mortality last meeting, we heard from one of the companies that it's much less. We've heard from others. Uh, and the technical committee that it's more. I guess I'm just wondering, some of the sensitivity analyses that are gonna be conducted, is it anticipated that that will also include varying that mortality uh, rate a little bit? Uh, reason I ask, I mean, we have a lot of discard mortality rates for fisheries where, depending on the area and the time of year and everything else, it might be just uh, sort of pertinent to that particular study, but here we have a situation where um, the biomedical uh, companies definitely have a handle on how much mortality there is, so I don't know why there's such a mystery about it. Um, the second question, if I may, it'll be a quick one. Christy, you mentioned a six-year update, and I'm just wondering, without violating any data confidentiality, in the last six years, what has been the average change in the biomedical use of horseshoe crabs. Um, so I guess what I'm wondering really, is six years really something that is just thought about right now as an estimate and can be modified later on if, if there is information um, on a composite basis that the biomedical process is taking more uh, horseshoe crabs. So thank you. Okay, first I'll answer your question about the 15%. Uh, we're gonna do a benchmark stock assessment in 2018. So at that point, we will have a great opportunity to reevaluate some of the studies, look back at the literature, and work with biomedical to reevaluate that number. Uh, so that's definitely something that's gonna happen. And when that happens for the benchmark, the arm will also adopt whatever they find to be the most appropriate number for the Delaware Bay region. And also, when we do the benchmark, we're hoping to be able to do that on the regional basis. So if there's a study specific to the southeast, we can apply that biomedical mortality to that region, as well as reevaluate that for the Delaware Bay. So it, it may not have to be a flat percentage. So if there's data specific to each region, we'll be able to use that at that time. Um, as for the second question, um, I think Kirby is going to speak to that, but yeah, the six is just an example, the six-year average. Um, biomedical is pretty um, consistent, and so I think what we would look at is how often does that, I mean, we should reevaluate it every so often, but do we do that on a pre-chosen number, or do we do that when there's some indication that it's changed, uh, and then we would have to revise it in the R model, but I think Kirby has something to add. Yeah, I was just going to offer, Rob, that, you know, in the supplemental materials, we included the FMP review, and it lays out biomedical collection and bleeding over 
I believe it's the last uh, five to, to seven years or so. So you can see uh, trends there, but to what Kristen was mentioning, it's, it's largely stayed uh, pretty constant in terms of the number of crabs that have been collected. The overall mortality coastwide has changed slightly year to year, but uh, that trend hasn't moved either way significantly in recent years. The questions, uh, Brandon? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just a question on the harvest estimate, harvest information that goes into the ARM model. Does it just uh, does it assume, or do we provide that it's just a five five hundred thousand male harvest? Do we actually use harvest numbers from the prior year? Thank you. We did talk about that recently, and it just assumes that that's what's being harvested, and it. It has been discussed that maybe that's not the most appropriate thing to do, but that could be something else to look at as we revise the model. But right now it assumes that harvest packages is what's being harvested in the Bay. Uh, and I know that's not exactly true every year. Babalu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kristen, excellent presentation, but if you could just return back to the core issue and expound a bit on why the workload would increase so significantly by uh, including the biomedical mortality in addition to the bait harvest mortality. It just seems like a, a different number, a larger number as it were. Uh, so why does that make it such a, you talked about sensitivities, could you just expand on that a little bit? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so to explore kind of the sensitivity of both of these options to would this push us to moratorium, would it most likely keep staying at 500,000? Um, changing the harvest packages is a little simpler to kind of explore because you just change that one number and then when the model goes through this optimization routine where it looks at all these possible states of the model based on all the years of data along with all those probabilities of moving to another stage or staying in the stage or the survivorship at each of those stage or the fecundity in that year or the male-female ratio, it doesn't need to go through all of those with a different mortality rate. Uh, so both of them would take time, but doing the population dynamics one is just much more cumbersome. It, that's the lengthy process of the model, whether or not we change it. Um, when uh, Connor McGowan goes through the R model each year, it's that routine that is the time-consuming routine. So that's why adding mortality there would um, make that exploratory process a little longer. Other questions? I actually have one, um, which is, I won't put Kristen on the spot because um, it's, it's more of an ornithology question, so maybe Mike will help out. I, I was impressed by when I was reading the reports of the difficulty in sampling red knots. And I guess when I looked at it, and what's equally important is not only the horseshoe crab harvest, but the 89,000 number for the population that's fed into the model for the red knots. Um, but and right now, I think it was 40-something thousand was the population estimate that's put into that. But how confident are we? Because when I looked at the, the, uh, the report on the sampling for that, it seems to be a real interesting way. It's almost like a data-poor species from a fisheries perspective. So, I mean, is there a lot of error with that, or is, can you just uh, expand on that a little bit? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would remind you I'm not an ornithologist, but... <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I think Jim Lyons' estimates from the Mark Recapture does have error bars around it. So uh, I, I feel a lot more confident about those estimates than, than the old aerial uh, surveys that the uh, state of New Jersey was conducting. I don't have those numbers in front of me with the error bars, but I, I think it's about as good as we can do right now for that, a species like that. Um, I feel pretty good about it myself. Great. Thanks, Mike. Bill Adler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I remember uh, when they were talking about red knots and where they are and where they're not, um, that uh, there was some concern that they were still around, but they weren't landing or coming to the place where the, we always thought they would be coming. And I didn't know if any of that information uh, has been added into um, the red knot population estimates um, that there were other places where these things were landing that we just, I, I think you remember all that. But I don't know if any of that got into the statistics as to um, the 
population size of the red knot. I, I don't know if they did anything on that. Uh, we talked about that a little bit at the TC meeting because there were some concerns about how much the population had bounced around in the last three years that from 2014 then it went up pretty high in 2015 and came back down and many felt that that well fluctuation is natural that that big of a leap couldn't be attributed to births and deaths alone so we did talk a little bit about how uh, maybe they didn't stop in the bay at the same proportions that year as they usually do um, or they stayed a different amount of time so uh, that's definitely part of the estimation process but I, it's not necessarily accounted for in the arm other than when uh, we get that mark recite abundance um, fluctuations can be explained by those things that you're talking about Mike thank you mr. chairman and, and thanks for that report Kristen I, I have a, a an observation I think and then a, followed by a question in talking to uh, the some folks on the arm committee about the behavior of the model that I think there was a discussion in your meeting that the, the because of the optimization routine and the way the model works, and because of the thresholds that you explained to us nicely at the beginning of your presentation, it's either going to want to go full open, wide open, and harvest as many, once, once females take value, harvest as many as you can until they no longer have value, according to that threshold, and then go to zero. Uh, so uh, to drop into an analogy, it's like if you're in a car, it's either going to be in fifth gear, top speed, or in neutral. It's never going to want to cruise along in third gear, is, is what I'm hearing. Now, I don't know if they've, they've explored that rigorously uh, with the model, but I guess that's my question to you. Is, you mentioned it's time consuming, but I think the board, at least at the last meeting, said, well, we'd like to see more about how that behaves. So it, are they, in fact, going to uh, undertake that analysis? <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, I would say that's uh, accurate, that the model prefers uh, package one, three, and five, which is moratorium, the highest male-only harvest, and then the highest male and female harvest, uh, that those two other options aren't chosen as much. Um, exploring that, uh, I think, was part of the long-term review we suggested. So maybe about a year ago, we put forth what items could be accomplished on a short-term review process and what could be accomplished on a longer term. And at that time, uh, we were tasked with doing the short-term review. So if we had the opportunity to do a long-term review, certainly exploring what harvest packages might be more appropriate uh, or why those two aren't chosen would be part of that as well as moving the ARM model into a different software program that would be more accessible for staff because uh, uh, right now it's not it's not run by us it's it's run somewhere else uh, so those were two longer term goals but yes that's certainly a concern and uh, a hope for moving forward Okay, I think we're going to move along, and Kirby is now going to give us uh, an update on draft addendum 8. Kirby? All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, Kristen, and I think, teed this up pretty nicely for me. I'm going to walk through kind of where, how we got to where we are today, the August 2016 board meeting, uh, trying to develop the draft addendum 8 coming out of that some of the ARM subcommittee comments we received, next steps, questions, and considering bo uh, board action today. So at the August 2016 board meeting, as you all uh, should remember, uh, the ARM subcommittee and TCs presented their recommendations on how to include biomedical mortality into the ARM framework. Uh, there was two options, as Kristen laid out. The preferred option, reduced the bait harvest and accounted for biomedical mortality. The second option, which we were calling a minority option, added biomedical mortality into the population dynamics model. So taking that into consideration, the board initiated an addendum to uh, include biomedical mortality as well as bait harvest packages that allowed for female harvest, and that was specifically outlined in Appendix C of one of the meeting materials we offered up um, for the August meeting. So in coming back to, um, to the addendum after the uh, board meeting, uh, staff sat down and we tried to think through logistically how this, how this addendum could play out. So one thought 
uh, at first was an initial decision tree on how to deal with biomedical mortality. It's important to understand that from that you then would have to move down to figuring out what harvest package would be the next option for someone to select and we kind of coined it as a choose your own adventure in this way. When you do this there is the possibility to have significant variation depending on what biomedical mortality option is chosen initially. So in this slide we have a breakdown of what the current harvest packages are as Kristen presented and then with that preferred option how they are slightly adjusted. So you start off with biomedical mortality, you have that decision point whether to include it or not. It's pretty straightforward. No, you move to status quo. If yes, there are two options that are laid out, right? The preferred and the minority. The next step in that would be after you've chosen which of the options you'd want to use to uh, account for biomedical mortality, you would select a harvest package. And again, we are we were guided to, to select or at least include in the addendum the options that were laid out in the Appendix C. So uh, as, I, as I tried to explain, we have there's two decision points in the decision tree, how to account for biomedical mortality and then moving down to your harvest packages. When you start to look at this with the, the variations, you come up with multiple versions of harvest packages. The status quo would already get you at possibly uh, two separate versions of the same sets of harvest packages. You add in Appendix C, you have four additional sets of harvest packages to look at. When you then times that by two, we'd be looking at somewhere in the ballpark of about 18 possible options that would be included in the addendum. Um, from a staff standpoint, we express some concern that this may be possibly too many for the public to consider um, and provide adequate comments on. As Kristen laid out in her presentation, uh, I believe the harvest packages have been evaluated and were evaluated by the ARM subcommittee going into that August meeting. Um, as part of the initial task way back la about a year ago when, when the ARM subcommittee was asked to look at how to get at female harvest in the bait industry, uh, the ARM subcommittee looked at that and found that um, while there may be an interest in adding more female harvest or female options that have female uh, harvest, unless you are above that threshold that Kristen laid out, you're not going to increase the likelihood of getting female harvest. So, so long as you're below that threshold, you can add as many harvest packages as you'd like to, to have options for female harvest, but you won't get there. Um, so with that in mind, this could possibly further confuse uh, public comment uh, for the draft addendum process and that they may, we may be going out to the public with these 18 options and asking them to provide us comment when in actuality if they chose one of those options, we couldn't necessarily tell them for sure that if, it in all, if all the options that it included female harvest, that that would actually be selected in a given year. With this information, we brought it back to some members of the board to, to further explain how and get guidance on how to, to move forward with this addendum. Uh, with this information, the board, uh, some of the board members asked us to, to look at whether it be possible to, to do sensitivity analyses to get at how, say, including biomedical mortality would have changed harvest package selections in previous years. So one of these ideas that was put forward was doing sensitivity analysis around the two versions of how to include biomedical mortality going back between five to ten years running the model with then these these biomedical uh, options in there and again the, the model inputs would be using the abundance index from the Virginia Tech trawl survey or the composite index and putting that in so we're keep, we'd be keeping pretty much everything constant it would just be seeing how the model would react with this new variation in it so in bringing this to the ARM subcommittee in September, they expressed some concerns about the decision making process in this and it being largely results driven versus uh, making decisions that made the most sense based on the information we have on the population and biological characteristics um, at each stage in the model. As Kristen laid out, we have also talked with them about the sensitivity analysis work, analysis work and they expressed some concern that uh, it would take some time. 
Anecdotally, the armed subcommittee members uh, also offered that they thought that a, the approximate 34,000 uh, mortality that may be coming out of the Delaware Bay, this is again a, a, a guesstimate, not a, an actual number, would be an, a negligible amount um, and wouldn't necessarily change the optimized harvest package. The reason why is because the magnitude of the biomedical mortality there would be very small compared to the magnitude of the abundance that we're using to set the harvest packages and specifications annually. So we, you were just shown the graphs of what the male and female harvest es or abundance estimates are in the Delaware Bay region, and so the magnitude between that abundance estimate and what these these changes are in the mortality, um, they, they deem to be uh, possibly negligible. A separate note: harvesting. Uh, Female crabs, this is related to trying to put in more options that would possibly select female. So long as you're below the threshold, if you start to violate the rules of the ARM um, framework, uh, you may be able to get a female harvest today, but it will actually push your timetable to, to getting at an optimized option for female harvest, that is, the model actually selecting it. It will take a longer time to get to that because, again, it's, it's under the impression that uh, it's still at a depleted state. So we followed up with the armed subcommittee's uh, members regarding specifically how long the timetable would be between getting these analyses done and presenting them to the board. The first one, as Kristen laid out, uh, wouldn't take uh, a tremendous amount of time uh, because of the, the lack of iterations that the model would have to go through. The second one, um, after a little bit more conversation, we learned would, would possi possibly be able to be completed by uh, summer of next year, 2017. Um, and for the reasons that have been laid out already, that it'd be time consuming giving the multiple iterations and the software availability and experience limitations um, and try to, to run it. Some additional considerations uh, for the board is that with this addendum having been initiated in August and the benchmark stock assessment set to be started in 2017 and completed in 2018, um, there's a lot of work that the ARM subcommittee will hopefully be contributing to the technical committee and stock assessment subcommittees in completing the 2018 assessment. And there's potentially new information that would be coming out of that assessment to help inform uh, this process. In having an addendum that would be at its earliest um, completed by mid or maybe even a year from now in 2017, the earliest it would be implementing harvest packages for would be 2018. And therefore, we would be possibly going through the same process again once we had the results of the benchmark stock assessment. So uh, there may be the possibility that it would be a redundant um, effort. So next steps, uh, as staff, we're looking for guidance from the board on, on whether to proceed in continuing development of this addendum. Um, and also to consider possibly addressing this addendum after the 2018 benchmark stock assessment has been completed. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Kirby. Great presentation. Mike Louisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I may be able to save you and the other commissioners around the table here a little time and quit with, with questions. Um, so I've got some thoughts, and you know I appreciate on the agenda this presentation by Kirby was, um, was labeled as challenges with developing this addendum. And I would, I would argue that this is more than a challenge. Challenges are things we can overcome. And this, there's, there's more of a roadblock here as far as what we currently have as a framework for managing um, horseshoe crabs with the red knot and trying to make adjustments, uh, as Mike alluded to, kind of this you know, third gear rather than either neutral or in fifth gear. And, you know, for any of you who know me well, I can be a little stubborn when I get something in my mind. And I just want to thank Kirby and Kristen for putting up with me the last few months as we've communicated back and forth a number of times about how we could try to proceed with, with this addendum um, in accomplishing the goals that, that, you know, this board approved as far as moving forward. And the way that I see it now and where we currently stand, is that we're going to set measures for 2017. By the time an addendum would be finalized, we'd, we'd, all, we'd be right at the, ba at the base of a, of a benchmark stock assessment. And um, given the comments that have already been made by staff, and I think that it, 
it's probably in our best interest right now to hold off on any further development of this addendum uh, until the benchmark's completed. It sounds to me like the benchmark is the way we can maybe address some of the some of the roadblocks, some of the walls that are that are within the model right now uh, in moving forward. So, it, you know, at, when you're ready, uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have a motion I'd like to make. Okay, Mike. Uh, just let me see if there's other comments uh, along with where you're going. Or I'll oppose to that. And if we don't have that, I think we'll put your motion up. Any any other questions or comments uh, for Kirby or what Mike just said? Okay, Mike. Go ahead. Give us your motion. Okay, I'd move to postpone the development of draft addendum eight until after the 2018 benchmark stock assessment has been completed. Okay, second by Roy Miller. Is there discussion on the motion? Robert Riley. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the only comment I have is I saw on one of the slides an indication that there's some experience needed and some software that needs to be mastered, perhaps, um, as part of this process. So even though I support the motion, it would seem that that also allows time for accomplishment of, of you know, learning that software, the new software that might be needed and also getting the experience um, that's also needed. So I wanted to make that comment. Thanks, Rob. Any other questions? Brandon Muffley. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I support the motion as well. I guess my, my question is, do we think we'll, we will continue to work on some of these uh, items that we talked about regarding the ARM model? Will we run sort of these sensitivity analysis with the two different um, biomedical, you know, methodologies and evaluating, you know, the actual harvest versus the assumed harvest of 500,000 crabs. Will we continue to evaluate the model as we go forward since we're going to kind of delay? I just want us to kind of be ready once that stock assessment goes that we've maybe kind of answered some of these questions within the R model that we're ready to, to move forward. Yes, thank, thank you, Brandon. So um, that's definitely uh, an option and a possibility for the for the armed subcommittee. I think it just needs to be clear coming out of this meeting that that's a request of the board that that that, that analysis be carried forward. Uh, if this motion passes, that that it is kind of you know moving on two different timetables. Then, um, but if if that's the pleasure of the board, then just making sure that's that's clearly uh, tasked to them would be great. Good, Brandon. Do, do you want to? Do you think we need a motion then, or I mean, I would support. I think that's the way we need to go. I mean, I I support delaying and get everything getting everything right and wait for the assessment. I think that's key, but I don't want to lose time on the work that we need to do on the R model. I don't think we need a motion on it, Brandon. I think that's pretty well documented. That's where we're going to go. So I think we're okay on it. Mike, you have a comment? Uh, Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, too, support the motion, and I, I thank Mike for making it. My, my sense is after the benchmark, uh, we can revisit the arm in a sense that, that we were looking at these harvest packages, but those aren't the knobs that we want to uh, tune with. We want to go back out to the thresholds, maybe, and the value functions, and, and those would be the tuning knobs that, uh, that the arm would consider, I think, if I'm understanding correctly, after the benchmark assessment. Yeah, I, I agree, Mike. I think that's, that's correct. Um, any other discussion? Mike Louisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one more thing to add, um, not regarding the model, but the regarding the biomedical industry. Um, in conversations that I've had with Kirby and Kristen, uh, I, think, I think there may be things that we can do as states to help better understand the mortality associated with with the biomedical uh, companies, and I, you know, I don't. All the details aren't in my head right now, but maybe you know, Kirby, you and I have spoken about it about what we might be able to do to to capture the information that would help under, help us all understand a little more clearly um, the mortality associated with bio, with the biomedical industry, and maybe that could be factored in at a later date rather than incorporating that mortality now 
you know, after the benchmark, we might have a better understanding. I don't know if there's anything we can, that you might be able to send out to the states as far as a request for how we'd better those data. Um, but, you know, maybe I just ask, maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Sure thing. So, uh, as hopefully all the board members are aware, uh, last week prior to this meeting, uh, Jim sent out an email uh, laying uh, basically as a reminder that those states that have biomedical facilities that are bleeding crabs currently are required to submit information on that. You know, the, the number of males and the number of females that have been bled because we have a, a process and a procedure for applying a mortality to that. Um, as laid out in Jim's email, we haven't necessarily been getting the best uh, information on that recently. So uh, I'll be hitting on that point a little bit during my presentation for the FMP review. Um, but just as a, you know, a setup to that, it will be important for those states to keep in mind that um, if you're able to give a better sense of what the mortality is at each stage from the collection through to those crabs that are bled and released as well as those crabs that have been not used for bleeding but discarded because that can sometimes be a large category that will help not just for compliance components but also for the upcoming benchmark stock assessment when we're going to be looking at how to to best understand this data at a regional level so Okay, uh, let me just go to the, uh, the audience quickly. Any, any public comment on the motion? Okay, seeing none, back to the board. Any last discussion before we vote? Okay, seeing none, is, let me just start. Is there any objection to this motion? Okay, so <laughs> I guess we are going to vote. Uh, comment, Melissa, or not? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't feel like I've uh, sowed my uh, oats here long enough to make a comment. This is only my second meeting. Um, but in reading the uh, letter from uh, the Limaluli, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, laboratories, my confusion really rests in the fact that it sounds like that there is reporting data available. I don't have the information of how that's relayed to whether it's the states or to this organization. Um, but as a legislator, I've seen firsthand uh, putting off hard decisions, and uh, I am very concerned after attending the August meeting, hearing this, once again, here we are uh, postponing these kinds of tough decisions, and for that reason, I oppose it. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Any other discussion before we vote? Okay. Um, does anybody need a caucus? Okay, two minutes for a caucus. Okay, we're ready to take the vote. Dot, do, this, do we need to read this? Okay. Move to postpone development of draft addendum 8 until after the 2018 horseshoe crab benchmark stock assessment has been completed. A motion by Mr. Luisi and seconded by Mr. Miller. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Fifteen in favor, all opposed? No opposed. Any null votes? Any abstentions? Motion passes 15 0, 0, 0. Thanks. That was we're ahead of schedule. Okay. Um, next we're going to go into um, technical committee reports, and Steve Doctor has got a whole lot of great stuff to tell us. Steve? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, go on the next one. Okay, we're going to look at a couple things here. We had a pretty productive uh, technical committee meeting about a month ago, and I'm going to try to go through uh, some of the conclusions we came to. Um, first, I'm going to go over the ARM framework and the recommendation for the optimal harvest, and then we're going to look at some horseshoe crab surveys. We're going to review the shorebird survey. 
We're going to talk about alternative bait trials, and then we're going to talk about the United States Fish and Wildlife Service response to the ESA listing. Okay, so um, we were given uh, Harvard's package three, which is the 500 male only harvest, and um, it was based on the composite index and uh, red knot mark recite population estimates that are the best available science at this point, and the uh, technical committee was unanimous in um, recommending the ARM package at package three. Okay, and now we're going to go into some. Um, surveys here. The Delaware Bay Trawl Survey is um, one of the um, indexes that are going to um, the R model and um, thanks to Jeff Brust who does, um, he's the Excel master of the coast, um, we have like male and female broken out, some nice graphs here from them. And um, so I'm going to go through these pretty quickly and um, they're basically showing pretty much the same trend. This is the New Jersey Ocean Trawl Survey. And when I say they're showing the same trend, they're all pretty much stable, stable is what I would say. Some of them, some of them are starting to show a little bit of increase in the um, tail end of the survey. And this is also, uh, this is the ocean trawl survey, and it's uh, also um, in the composite index. The composite index is made up of three surveys. And then this is Delaware Bay spawning survey. Um, the one survey that has a little bit of a significant trend is the beach um, Delaware Bay spawning survey has a significant trend and a decline in females but when we go further you'll see that when you put them all together it doesn't show up. Um, the next one is the Delaware surveys. I think Stu Mickles has his hands in these maybe um, John Clark too. Um, these surveys are um, a, a 16 and a 30 foot trawl survey in Delaware Bay. And then um, this is the Maryland um, Offshore Trawl Survey. This is my survey, so I'll spend the most time on this one. Um, you'll see that this is taken on commercial boats that go offshore, and they're collecting horseshoe crabs for bait and biomedical. And you'll see it goes along here real good until about 2008. And, you know, I wish that was an increase in horseshoe crabs, but what they discovered is that you catch more horseshoe crabs at night. So they went to doing the survey at night. And also the Virginia Tech Trawl Survey also discovered this. So it's been a learning experience going through this horseshoe crab stuff. And um, you'll see this one index up here is really high. And that year, we were averaging 60 horseshoe crabs per minute. So while the 2008 you'll see a jump and it's still an upward trend. I really don't think that this um, index is going to go much higher because you really can't cram more than 5,000 um, horseshoe crabs into the net in 40 minutes. So we'll probably plateau off there, but it did show an increase for a while. And so I've given you a bunch of surveys and what I'd kind of like to do now is try to tie it all together for you. And so I've been involved with this since 1998. We started with um, horseshoe crabs and eels in 98, and I met some great guys, Stu Mickles and John Clark and Mike Millard, and we, um, we've been working on this ever since. Um, back then, um, Stu and John, we used to go across the street to a gas station to get um, our lobster rolls, so we're, we're a little bit, we've evolved a little bit since then. But so um, what I'd like to show you here is, um, there's a paper by Suica, Smith, and um, Millard that um, was done in 2007, and what it did, it did a forward projection of the female, the female abundance using this model that they had. It's a stage space model projection, and um, what it, what you have down here on the on the x-axis is years. What I want to show you here is that they started at like 3,000 females, but they didn't really know where it was. So the population came up to like 6,000. And um, what this, the reason I'm showing you this is the, the stock seems to be acting like what the projection said it would do. And um, if you go to it, we're in year, um, let's see, where am I, I'm in my notes here. We're at right now at like 68, 6,800 animals is like 30, year 37 of the projection. That, that isn't as important as what the projection does from there. 
to get to the threshold, this is actually where carrying capacity comes from too. That's why I started looking at this because the 80% carrying capacity is the threshold for female harvest. So it's going to be about 44 years before we get to that 11,000 animals carrying capacity where female harvest is going to be allowed. So while we, get, we look forward to like the index every year, where the male crabs are, where the female crabs, I kind of want to temper your expectations that we're going to walk in here one day and we're going to have female harvest. I mean, it looks like about 2060 is where it's going to happen. And the reason I have faith in this is I overlaid the projection to the, um, the, the estimates of abundance of female crabs from the composite index and also the Virginia Tech survey. And as a um, fisheries biologist, you live for stuff like this where you can get a correlation that that's that, 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 that's that strong like that. It just matches beautifully. So what this tells me is I kind of almost believe the rest of the female abundance and where it's going. So that's kind of um, interesting. So the reason I'm bringing this up is, like I said, I don't want you to walk in here and think that we're going to go to package four next year. It's probably going to be like 2060, so um, that's, that's why I want to let you know. Also, with the, um, with the female, with the red knot, I talked with Jim Lyons, who is the Fish and Wildlife. He's a really excellent ornithologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I said, well, Jim, how are the other shorebirds doing? Because like red knots, are like we're trying to do this for red knots, but red knots, you might want to think of a more of like a poster child for um, shorebirds because there's like 15 different kinds of shorebirds. There's plovers, sanderlings, all up in Delaware Bay. While these horseshoe crab abundance eggs are affecting the red knots, they're affecting all the shorebirds. So I said, Jim, how are the shorebird populations doing up and down the coast? He says, they're all declining. And he says, and the ones that are declining the fastest are the ones that travel the furthest. Well, do you know a bird that goes further than from Tierra del Fugo to Hudson Bay? I mean, that bird goes a long way, and there's a lot of things affecting that bird along that route. So to see this population, which I think Jim Lyons' estimate is excellent, go from 40,000 to 80,000 birds. Does anybody want to take some bets with me? I don't think it's going to happen next year. Okay, so... I just wanted to give you that information. Um, the shorebird stopover and winter population estimates are low but stable. The horseshoe crab estimates are low but stable. Um, in the long term, where are we? Well, we got this um, package five, and um, you know it's not really a bad thing. We're, we're the market is kind of like stabled out. Maryland had a really hard time. We've had the same harvest package for four years now. But the market kind of found itself. It worked itself out. The worst thing to have is a, the worst thing than a bad harvest package is having, changing your harvest package. So we've left the harvest alone for four years. The market's kind of adapted to it. And we, I think we can kind of feel good that we're trying to do what we can for the red knots and other shorebirds. They might not come back. You know, we might be here in 2060, or some of our offspring might be here in 2060. And, um, but we are doing what we can, and the market seems to have, uh, like, found itself. So I just want to give you that message on the population. Okay, so then um, I'm going to move on to alternative bait discussion. Um, we were going to go ahead and um, try some alternative bait from um, one supplier, and we sat together as a technical committee, and we decided, you know, we can't get this product sometimes. We're not sure if it works. So what we decided to do is step back a little bit and do a survey of what bait practices actually are right now, what the cost of the baits are, and then move forward from there. So um, there's a recommendation from the technical committee that all states evaluate the feasibility of conducting a survey to get bait bag ingredients and report back survey results by the beginning of 2017. So that's where the technical committee is moving forward on that. The next thing is the red knot listing, and I got to be careful with my language here. Let's see what we're doing here. Okay, um, so um, what the the, the services kind of changed the way that they do uh, threatened and endangered species, and they're um, doing a, a species status assessment, and they're um, looking at critical habitat proposals for um, the red knot. 
And so it doesn't really affect us because as long as the R model is in place, they're not considering the uh, harvest of horseshoe crabs as incidental take. So that's something that I just want to uh, let the board know that um, we're progressing on. As, I mean, the Fish and Wildlife Service is progressing on, and it looks like we're in, in the green, to, to make the thing short. And so the one last thing that I would like to add is that um, the AFSMFC has brought on a guy by the name of Mike Smetke. He's over here. He's going to be our new coordinator for horseshoe crabs. And the guy is a stock assessment guru. He's really good. And, and with Kristen on it, I'm really happy. I'm really happy that AFSMFC has stepped up and brought these um, really good stock assessment people to help with our um, 2018 um, exercise. And um, with that, I conclude my report. And um, if there's any questions, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Steve. That was enlightening. Um, <laughs> so let's see. It's the 75th anniversary, so at the 118th anniversary, we'll be having female harvest. Mike, how's that set? <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Steve, we ought to meet in my office when we get back uh, in a few days. Thanks. Questions for, for Steve? Babalu. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Steve. That was an awesome presentation. Um, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to circle back to the alternative bait uh, portion of your presentation. Uh, it makes good sense to me that the survey work would be an, a logical next step before moving forward with additional trials. You want to get a good handle on what the needs are of the, of the, of the fishermen that rely upon bait. And um, yet I'm not sure, I, I think there was some bullet there where it was sort of like the Rhode Island prospectus, prospectus was discussed and, and I don't know what phrase you used, but it didn't seem like it, it necessarily carried forward. You know, for me the prospectus, and it was frankly um, inspired by Tony Kearns, was all about trying to set some objectives in terms of what, what, why would we even pursue alternative bait? And I think, as I remember, it was something along the lines of, well, there has to be some sort of conservation benefit. The bait has to prove that it's using less horseshoe crabs than, than, than just using horseshoe crabs. Um, the efficacy needs to be there. The cost needs to be, com you know, needs to be reasonable and hopefully comparable. And uh, the logistics and the handling need to be there. That those were the seemed to be the factors that would, that would drive us forward in an alternative bait, um, you know, in, in our efforts to explore the use of alternative bait. So, does the TC still identify with those issues, or is there some other perspective now that I'm missing in terms of where the TC is on this issue? I, I, I just felt like those were key concepts to put forward so that we knew what we were trying to do and what we were looking to evaluate. And if it didn't meet those standards, if alternative bait wasn't as effective, wasn't as uh, you know, uh, uh, affordable, uh, and certainly didn't lead to a conservation benefit, i.e. use less horseshoe crabs than otherwise, what, no point in pursuing it. But I thought that was the whole point, to explore those issues. So are those issues still relevant? Thank you. Those issues are absolutely relevant, and it's because of those issues that we went forward with the action that we did. Thank you. Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve, can you bring us up to speed on, on what alternative bait trials have been conducted thus far? Are there any, uh, were there any ongoing this year, or is everything still in the planning stage in that regard, using the um, um, alternative baits, artificial baits, whatever you want to call them? Thank you. So there was a study done last year, and I believe it was Rhode Island that did it. Was it Rhode Island that did the study last year? And Connecticut, I believe. And Connecticut. And um, it was a bait um, by one vendor, and um, there was a lot of problems getting the bait, number one, handling the bait, using the bait. And it seemed to have some e efficacy, and there is a report available of it. And um, it also used female horseshoe crab in the bait, which was kind of disconcerting for a lot of people. And also, they were not specific on how much female horseshoe crab they are using. And the cost of the bait was a question. And the more we looked into it, the more questions we had. And so what we tried to do as a technical committee is identify what questions we have. And one of the main questions ha we had is, what baits are people using? How much of it are they using, and what is the cost of it? And we needed to know that information before we would be able to compare it to an artificial bait. Go ahead, Roy. 
If I may just follow up on that, was that bait that was tried in Rhode Island and Connecticut, was that the bait that University of Delaware worked on that contained roughly a tenth of a horseshoe crab uh, that was marketed by La Monica Foods, or was it something else? Thanks, Roy. I, I'm going to um, help Steve out on this just a little bit because I was closer to it in the spring. So, um, I, you know, staff was instructed coming out of, I believe it was the February meeting, to try to undertake this cost comparison. And uh, between what the, the bait that was used in those trials in Connecticut and in Rhode Island, which was La Monica Fine Foods product, um, and determine if, you know, if it was the most cost effective alternative to what fishermen are doing currently in terms of their mix or suite of ingredients they're using in their bait bags and pots. And what we found during those trials was that while the ratio for the pucks was anywhere between uh, a tenth to a quarter of a crab, because it wasn't as effective in, in staying together, many times they'd have to double up on the dosage. So that could increase it up to anywhere between a quarter to a half, and in some instances even more. What Steve was just mentioning is another concern that the TC had, which is the composition wasn't always clear how much of the females and males were in it. The idea was that um, you would need more males to, equi to be equivalent to females in terms of it uh, as an attractant. Um, but we didn't have that breakdown for what each puck had um, because that composition wasn't that information wasn't available to us. Additionally, we also didn't know where these crabs were coming from on the coast. When speaking with La Monica Fine Foods about this, that you know they they go from uh, purchasing this from dealers uh, up and down the coast. So if we're concerned, or if the board is concerned, excuse me, about the populations in other parts of the coast that these crabs may be coming from, the conservation savings or benefits from it may be compromised in that way. So. Other questions for Steve? So unless there's any more advice, I think the TC and the and staff are pretty well um, ready to go and on, on, a, on the addendum. So uh, unless there's anything else uh, that we want to add to that, I think they'll be ready to move forward and then reporting back in the May 28, 2017 meeting. So everybody good with that? Okay. Great. I think we'll move along now then to um, item number six, which is the 2017 Delaware Bay Horseshoe Crab Specs. And Kirby's going to give us a presentation on that first. Kirby. All right, so this should be very straightforward given the presentations we just walked through this morning so far. Uh, 2017 harvest specifications for the Delaware Bay region. There's the ARM recommendation uh, for harvest package three. Uh, it's the same as what's been in place the, the previous three years. Uh, both the ARM subcommittee and the technical committees together recommended this package be selected. Just in terms of a breakdown of what that means, it's 500,000 male only crabs and the state quotas uh, under that 500,000 uh, male-only crabs is broken down as the following. Uh, Delaware and New Jersey are uh, proportioned to 162,136. Also understanding that New Jersey's bait fishery has been closed um, in recent years. Maryland's um, Delaware Bay origin quota would be 141,112, and Virginia's is 34,615 east of the coal reg lines for male-only male harvest. So with that, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take it, uh, but this is for board uh, consideration and action. Questions for Kirby? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna need a motion to uh, move forward on this. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Um, I don't know if you guys prepared one already, but I guess what you're looking for is a motion would be to move to uh, select Harvest Package 3 for the 2017 Horseshoe Crab Commercial Fishery. 
perfect, Mike. Second, <laughs> Stu Mickles. Discussion on the motion? Emerson Hasbrook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does that motion need to say for Delaware Bay? Yes, I think it does. That okay, Mike? Uh, friendly addition. Some wordsmithing, yes, for Delaware Bay. Good, good point, Emerson. I think we're going to be using this motion for till 2060, so <laughs> we should perfect it now. It's a very good point. <laughs> uh, other discussion on the motion? Questions on the motion? So this is a, uh, a final action. Um, actually, we go to the audience first. Is there any comments on the motion from the audience? Okay, seeing none, back to the board. It's a final motion, so we're going to need to do a roll call vote unless there is no objection to the motion. So let's start there. Is there any objection to the motion? Great. Seeing none, we will uh, approve the motion without objection. Without objection. Dot, did I need to read that? Okay, let me just read it just so we're really clear. Move to select harvest package three for 2017 horseshoe crab harvest in Delaware Bay. A motion by Mr. Luisi, seconded by Mr. Michaels. Um, and that motion is adopted unanimously. Thanks, everyone. We're on to other business right now. We actually have, we have um, essentially some discussion on the advisory panel, so. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed one. Uh, we're going to do the FMP review, and Kirby, you're going to do that? All right, so if you guys just bear with me a little bit longer on this, we're going to go through the uh, horseshoe crab FMP review fairly quickly. Um, so first, uh, I want to show you, this is a chart we had been using in previous years to lay out um, how bait and biomedical uh, harvest and collection have gone in uh, <coughs> recent years. And I, I just want to note that we, we've moved away from this uh, graph, and later on in the PowerPoint, I'm going to show you the new one that we've, we're, we're using for our outreach information um, just to, to get at more accuracy and uh, from feedback we got from the advisory panel members on it. So the 2015 uh, bait fishery total coastwide harvest was approximately 583,000 crabs. A majority of those crabs came from the states of Delaware, New York, and Massachusetts. They combined for about 70% of the coastwide harvest. Um, overall, though, it's a decrease in what the harvest levels were relative to 2014. Uh, Delaware through Virginia, as well as Georgia through Florida, all decreased landings from 2014. Um, it's important, I guess, to note that the that le the, the total coastwide landings is approximately 36% of the total coastwide quota. Um, so so uh, in terms of the number of crabs that are being harvested uh, relative to uh, 1998, it, it's been a significant decrease. And even relative to last year, uh, it's, it's also a decline. When moving on to talking about biomedical collection and, and uh, bleeding, uh, the reported number of crabs that were brought to biomedical facilities was about 559,000 crabs. Uh, this is a 3% decrease from the previous five-year average. Crabs used as bait and that were bled was about 56,000 uh, crabs, which is a 2% decrease from the past five-year average. And biomedical-only uh, mortality estimate is approximately 70,000 uh, 223. And if you need more information on how that's broken down, why we're looking at bio biomedical only blood crabs, it's in part because uh, those that are used for the bait fishery are also then given back and, and um, attributed as having completely died, no, no assumed post release mortality for those. So this is the new graph that we have on our website, and I just wanted to make sure the board was aware of it, that it, it lays out what the commercial landings are, what the number of crabs that have been collected are, and then the additional um, bar is the estimated biomedical mortality. Uh, we have been uh, given a, at least some, some advice and, and um, approached about needing to change the graphics we were having on the website because people were, were concerned that it was misleading. So with some feedback from advisory panel members, we, we did make this change. Um, in going through the FMP review, uh, it was noted by some of the PRT uh, members that there's an interest in reporting out on some of the synthetic alternative um, uh, 
LAL uh, testing that's going on. Uh, we didn't have time to address that this year due to some of the time constraints, but that moving forward, this is something that the PRT would like to have included. Uh, there is also concern on the number of crabs that are unidentified by sex from biomedical bleeding. I, I mentioned this earlier on uh, in today's meeting about trying to get at this information better uh, across the coast. Uh, as, as noted, those states that have a biomedical facility and are bleeding crabs in their state need to report out that those numbers, males and females that have been bled. But what sometimes gets lost in translation is there are crabs that get to the facility and then are removed and not bled, and we get a total number for that. But we don't often get what that breakdown is by males and females. So while we might be getting the number going in of the males and females, if we're subtracting a number that isn't attributing it to sex specific, then it starts to confuse how many of those uh, males and females were actually bled and what the mortality should be applied to those. Um, it's important to note that the, that the board did task uh, the stock assessment subcommittee with addressing biomedical mortality in the next stock assessment. So the sooner um, the states are able to, to better collect this information and, and at least uh, provide guidance on how to maybe apportion a sex ratio if they aren't able to get at a specific uh, number uh, by males and females. Uh, it will help that process along significantly. Uh, the PRT recommends continuing to seek funding for the Virginia Tech Trawl Survey. Uh, I will note uh, additionally that during the technical committee's meeting, there was discussion about in the absence of the Virginia Tech Trawl Survey being able to be continued in future years if funding is not available, that the states of Delaware and New Jersey could possibly augment their current surveys to get at some of the bio, uh, biological sampling that we, we utilize through the Virginia Tech Trawl Survey. And, and state reps from those, uh, those states have indicated that that's a possibility and could be adjusted for future surveys. It just needs to be uh, specified earlier on in the process. Um, the, the PRT also considered a, a quota transfer from Virginia to North Carolina. Uh, this is a request that's, that's come now two years in a row. And there was some concerns expressed by the PRT just in terms of it being a, a, an occurrence that's happened more than once in recent years and whether that means that the quota should be uh, revisited um, for those states. But because of the size of the, the, the quota transfer, which was approximately 900 crabs, uh, they, they didn't raise significant concerns to the PRT um, about implications or, or impacts to that uh, regional population. So the PRT found, in summary, all the state uh, management measures to be consistent with the FMP. It's important to note again that DC, uh, the District of Columbia, did not submit a compliance report. Uh, they still remain a member of this board, um, and so the PRT was not able to determine if they were in compliance with the FMP requirements. So, uh, with that, uh, an additional note I, I walked you through the how to best improve reporting numbers of males and females at bleeding facilities. Uh, the PRT finds all states in compliance with the FMP. Um, uh, specifications. And then in, in looking at requests for de minimis, the Potomac River Fisheries Commission, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida have all requested de minimis and qualify for 2017. Uh, New Jersey also qualifies but did not request it. Um, and the PRT finds these states have met the requirements for de minimis. So with that, I'll take any questions um, at this point. Thank you. Thanks, Kirby. And uh, just for everyone's note, the uh, most important part of that slide was LAL. It means limulus amoebocyte lysate, uh, which may help you in jeopardy someday. Rob O'Reilly. Not a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But, Kirby, I heard you say the transfer from Virginia to North Carolina. It's Georgia to North Carolina. Correct. The quota transfer, and this was included, I believe, in your board meeting materials. It was a quota of transfer from Georgia to North Carolina. Brandon. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Kirby, I just want to, um, maybe you can, I just want to make sure I have it right. The bigger issue in regards to the um, sex information at the biomedical facility is sort of all of those crabs being collected and brought to the biomedical facility versus those crabs that are actually bled. You're getting more information by sex of crabs that are actually bled versus all of those that come to the facility. Is that, is that the piece that we're missing more so is the total number of crabs coming to the facility versus what's actually being bled? 
I think just to clarify, what we get many times from the states is a breakdown that you have X number of crabs have been brought to the facility, males and females. From the point in which they're brought to the facility to then when they're bled, there's a determination that some of those crabs aren't fit to be bled. Those crabs that are then removed, um, there hasn't been sex information attributed to them. So then they're said that X number of crabs are then bled, and we don't necessarily know after the other ones have been removed what that sex ratio is for uh, bled crabs. And that's where we start to, to have some, some confusion on what the total number of males and females that have been bled. So uh, for, for, for more clarity, if the states can work with the facilities to get better information on the numbers of males and females that once they're brought to the facility are determined not fit to be bled, that information will help us with getting at post-release mortality for those bled crabs by sex. Mike Millard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Kirby. Regarding the, the graphic on the uh, biomedical collection, um, I, I see the footnote says this pertains to crabs that are brought to the bleeding facility. Uh, uh, that 15% mortality is applied to those crabs that are brought into the facility. So maybe a question for Steve, who's more on the ground. I, I haven't been on one of these uh, biomedical collection trawls, but I have it in my head that uh, there's a fair amount of onboard culling that goes, because the biomeds don't want crabs that are damaged or punctured or uh, they, they want pretty much pristine condition crabs to br brought into their facility. So it, again, it's in my head that there's a fair amount of mortality that's not being accounted for then in that process because of the onboard culling that doesn't go into the facility. Can you uh, comment on that? So I can talk from the Maryland perspective. We have a um, chain of custody form that follows the crabs from the point of collection all the way to release again. And on that form, they actually list the number of crabs that are um, rejected because of death or injury, and we report that to AFSMFC when we report, you know, the, the total number bled and by male and female. So it is reported. Ed, Mike. So this this terminology on here about crabs brought to the facility is is not. It's really a little broader than that. Crabs that come up in the trawl is what, what the 15 percent is being accounted for. Is what I think I, I just heard. Okay, so Kirby says that we're reporting mortality on the number that are bled, not the total number collected. Go ahead, Mike. Well, okay, so my point is that that bears directly on this, this sort of ongoing back and forth we're having with the biomedical companies about is it 15 percent or isn't, you know, is it a lot less. I, I, I'm suggesting there's a large, uh, I don't know how large, but there's a component that's not being accounted for that are coming up in the trawl, damaged, going right back overboard, uh, and we don't know, you know, that's a mortality segment that we're not accounting for. I just uh, want to reiterate that I do report the number that are injured and dead at the time of collection and also at the time of release and also at the rejected because of death at the biomedical. So kind of we're in the middle somewhere. So the best way I can answer that. And I'm not sure what the other states do either, so it's a, it's a good point, Mike. It's, it could be higher. Michelle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to, if you read the materials, you probably saw this, but just to, in regards to the PRT's concern about um, sort of an annual request from North Carolina to Georgia to transfer horseshoe crabs, I just wanted to note that you know, we did actually shorten our harvest season for 2016 by a month to constrain harvest to within our quota and for that um, so we issue a proclamation uh, prior to the beginning of the year that establishes the season's um, start date and end date and we shortened that by a month and all of the harvest that was uh, legally pursued during that open season was actually underneath the quota it was actually illegal harvest that occurred after the season was closed that 
led to the overage. So um, enforcement action has been taken, and I think we, we feel pretty confident about next year. And thank you again to uh, Spud and Pat for helping us out. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. That was clearly in the briefing materials. You guys are definitely managing it and putting a lot of effort into it. Uh, any other questions? Colleen? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kirby, do we have an idea on the percentage of crabs that are brought to the facility and ultimately not bled? Yes, we have that information. Um, I will offer that, you know, for the FMP review, we have to aggregate this information right now on a coast-wide level. Uh, so um, we could drill down and try to provide that if, if needed uh, through the the benchmark stock assessment, um, but right now we, we, we have to aggregate it at the coast-wide level. And I can go back and look at the FMP review a little bit more closely, and if, you, if you'd like, I can work at trying to get at that per that amount that are brought to the facility and not bled coast-wide and get report back to the board on that. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to create more work. I was just trying to get a handle on how large a problem it is since we're trying to apply mortality by sex, and that's a group that's unaccounted for. Okay, any other questions? All right, we're going to need a... Sorry, folks, we just, um, we need a couple of motions here. We actually got four things we want to cover. So if, um, I think the first motion, if we combine it into one, which would be accepting the FMP review with the compliance reports and the de minimis as one motion would be efficient. And then we'll do the North Carolina Georgia transfer as a separate one. So does anyone have a motion for the first three that they would like to offer? Robert Boyles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, move that the board um, accept the 2016 FMP re uh, review and approve the de minimis request from the Potomac River Fisheries Commission, Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina, or whatever order is preferred. <laughs> we have a second to that motion. Bill Adler. Mike Louisi. Would you want to add state compliance reports to that too? Tackle all three. Is that okay with you, Robert? Yes, sir. Bill? Amy's going to get that up there. We want to add the state compliance reports. Why are we fixing any, any uh, discussion on the motion? Okay, I think we got the motion up there. Everybody can see it. Any any discussion on the motion? Okay, let me uh, read it into the record. Move to accept the Horseshoe Crab 2016 FMP review and state compliance reports and approve de minimis request for the Potomac River Fisheries Commission, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Motion by Mr. Boyles and seconded by Mr. Adler. Is there any objection to the motion? Okay, seeing none, we will approve that, adopt it unanimously. Okay, we're going to need a second motion now for the transfer from North Carolina, between North Carolina and Georgia. Michelle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that we, the board, approve the request for transfer of quota from Georgia to North Carolina. We have a second to that motion. Pat, here.
Discussion on the motion? Michelle, go ahead. Michelle, you got black gloves on. I can't see your hand. Sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll put my shiny gloves on next time. Um, perhaps we should just add the, the amount of the transfer, which is 1,250 crabs, to the motion, just to be clear. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll put that up. 1,250 was the number? Further discussion on the motion? Okay, let me read this before we take a vote. Uh, move that the board approve the request of transfer of quota 1,250 crabs from Georgia to North Carolina. A motion by Dr. Duval, seconded by Mr. Gear. Is there any objection to the motion? Okay, seeing none, we will adopt that unanimously. And I believe we are come down to just, oh, Bill Adler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to the previous motion that passed, about the de minimis and the compliance, did, did, wasn't it to um, the FMP, re approve the FMP report, the de minimis status and the compliance things? A and I, did, did it say all three in that motion? Yes. Okay. All right. I, okay, thank you. Bill. Um, okay. We're on to other business now. We have one item, which is uh, would follow with the AP and Kirby. You want to take that? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, one other thing that the technical committee did talk about when they met earlier this month was regarding the Shorebird Advisory Panel. Uh, there's been some discussion at times uh, among staff on how best to engage this group as they have not been uh, very active in the last four years or so. Uh, technical committee members recommended that the Shorebird Advisory Panel should be reinvigorated and repopulated and engaged in the Commission's process for reviewing any management actions and, and decisions. Um, one of the unique challenges just in terms of the dynamics we have with horseshoe crabs is that the shorebird advisory panel would be providing additional uh, input into the process that would, would be separate from what the state agency and federal agency partners who have shorebird bi biologists on the ARM subcommittee and the Delaware Bay Ecosystem Technical Committee um, and staff did make this clear to the uh, technical committees that, that it was not apparent what that additional input would, would be needed from, from those groups. But uh, a suggested way moving forward would be that the current horseshoe crab advisory panel be adjusted to accommodate two non-traditional stakeholder positions uh, that would be occupied by shorebird, uh, essentially AP members, uh, or to represent the shorebird um, conservation interest groups uh, as needed to accommodate that the interest of uh, the technical committees to have that representation in the process. So uh, this is a suggestion from staff moving forward. Uh, Tina Berger is up at the mic as well. The, the, what we're looking for moving forward from the states would be collectively would be adding two more uh, positions to the horseshoe crab advisory panel uh, that would be specific to shorebird uh, conservation interest uh, and possibly interest groups. Uh, and I can take any questions on that at this point. Uh, there, there doesn't need to be um, nominations made at this meeting, but to follow up with staff on who you would recommend having uh, join that. And again, it says two more positions for the entire coast, not per state. Thanks, Kirby. Any, any comments on that or questions for Kirby? So it, it appears we're all good then with just expanding the AP by the two members and then we'll come up with, uh, I guess, recommendations for the next meeting in February and uh, we'll, we'll vote on them at that point. So. Okay, seeing uh, no more on that, um, is there any other business to come before the Horseshoe Crab Board? Oh, Tina, go ahead. 
Just one more point. Um, we will be sending out the AP list to folks, and if you could look at your um, membership, um, there seems to be uh, less activity by the actual bait harvesters, um, so we'd like their voice heard um, to, to balance uh, AP input. So if you could look at that for your next meeting, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. Great homework. Okay, any other items to come before the Horseshoe Crab Board? If not, we will adjourn. Thank you, everyone. We'll start. Bob? Yeah, we'll start ACCSP at, at 10.15 as scheduled. Some folks are coming in just for that meeting, and I don't think we can go too early. So, um, we'll, so you can go out and enjoy the weather for a little bit.